Okay, great. Thank you so much. So uh, it's our pleasure to, uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathleen Merrigan, who uh, is in charge of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems, and we are all into that topic very deeply, and so it's very appropriate during lunch that we talk about how all of this comes together. And so, uh, welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. I'm actually going to put it right here. Does that work? So I don't know how this goes in. Oh, I got it. All right. Hey, everybody. So um, I am lunchtime entertainment, which means it's lunch and go up and get more food whenever you want. I'll just keep rambling on. And since it's lunchtime, I decided to take a smorgasbord kind of approach to my remarks. I've got uh, several different items that I'll touch upon briefly and then uh, a little fun dessert at the end. So I was asked to speak briefly about the farm bill. Oh, and by the way, I'm from the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems. And you might say, hey, Bruce this morning was also from the Sweetie Center. We have two Sweetie Centers at ASU because of the generosity of Brian and Kelly Sweetie. So uh, Bruce and I are both the beneficiaries, happily so. Um, so every five years or so, the Congress passes a farm bill. You've probably read about this. The last one wrapped up at the end of 2018. It's about $860 billion worth of money that's allocated by the Farm Bill over 10 years, but 77% of that goes to nutrition assistance. In other words, there's very little farm in the Farm Bill, actually. But of the amount of money that goes to the farm end of things, about $60 billion goes to conservation in this last farm bill, which was about level funding. The big shift was that the, within the conservation programs, less money went to what we might call working lands conservation program, the EQIP program, Environmental Qualities Incentive Program. You know, I've been in Washington too long. You forget what the acronyms really stand for. CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, the kind of programs that incent financially farmers through a cost share to do conservation practices on their lands. And for those uh, advocating for those programs in the sustainable ag communities, they felt that was a bit of a loss, even though, the, again, the, the funding that went to conservation was sort of level funded, as opposed to the last Farm Bill in 2014, when we lost about $6 billion in the conservation baseline. So, uh, so I guess we should be happy, um, but we're not ecstatic. The Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which was created in the 2014 Farm Bill, remains in this new Farm Bill with a little bit more money and a new mandate that 10% of the resources of that program be used to protect sources of drinking water. You've got a whole day here about phosphorus. I haven't done a word search in the 2018 Farm Bill for phosphorus, but I think you'd probably be disappointed overall um, with whatever that count is. So while everyone here in this room understands the critical nature of this issue, I would only be preaching to the choir. Um, we need more preaching, obviously. And we will not have a new farm bill for a number of years. Now, part of it is anything around conservation, anything around the environment, it sometimes has mixed receptions on the agriculture committees. I was once uh, author of a book chapter where I called the Senate Agriculture Committee a snake pit of decision making because I was upset about some of their environmental decisions. I was reminded of that book chapter when I was put before the Senate Agriculture Committee for confirmation, and the senators wanted to know if I still had that view. <clears throat> I softened my remarks, amended my remarks a little bit. But anyhow, it still is not a, a, a group of members that have environmental goals front and center when they go to a farm bill. Interestingly, though, the latest um, shifts in congressional membership has our agricultural appropriations committees in both in the House and the Senate with a much friendlier environmentally oriented crowd of members than we've ever had before. So I know there's supposed to be this strict line between 
authorizing and appropriating committees, meaning that the appropriators are not supposed to be writing new law in the context of a spending bill, but it does happen. And um, at least with the programs that are already in law, uh, they may see their way through to provide more resources. The money I'm talking about in the Farm Bill is mostly mandatory dollars, meaning that it's, it's an automatic payout of the Treasury every year. But there are ways to supplement that. And there certainly are programs relevant to water quality, water protection that are not mandatory and then rely upon those appropriators to put the dollars in. So that's my little wrap up of the Farm Bill. I was also asked to talk about FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Now, in my world of fruit and vegetables, that's all anyone's talking about because it is now about the time when inspectors are going to be going out to the farm. I just saw a notice from the National Coalition for Sustainable Agriculture saying to particularly small and mid-sized farmers, because they're doing a little this and a little that, be attentive to your phone answering machines because the inspectors are supposed to call the week before they arrive on site to do the inspection. But if you miss the call, it could be a surprise inspection. So we really are at that, at that moment of time when this is actually, after many, many years, uh, in, the, in the real implementation phase. I always say, if I ever write a book, and I haven't, um, and maybe never will, but I have a working title. And it would be, uh, Farmers Can't Chew Gum and Other Things I've Learned in Our Nation's Capital. And why I say that was at one point early on when I was Deputy Secretary, I was upset that one of the early iterations of the FISMA rule had it so that farmers couldn't chew gum and they couldn't spit. And I thought that was crazy. I mean, I love bubble gum, by the way. So. I couldn't, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of all the things that you could have trouble with on the farm, this was not a top 10 for me. And it actually took me uh, speaking to the deputy chief of staff to the president outside of the situation room, you know, where Amorosa was fired, uh, and, um, and really stopped it dead in the tracks there. So we see an agency, FDA, over the course of a number of years, learning more about agricultural production where their staff, that hasn't been their mainstay, right? And so it's really interesting what's going on in this implementation. And I know that um, there's, there are some regulations around soil amendments, and those are going through, but uh, soil uh, amendments of animal origin, I should say. Mm -hmm. But just recently, the um, FDA came out and said that their um, uh, the compliance with the ag water uh, rules was going to be delayed. And it's going to be delayed based on farm size. The smallest of farms wouldn't have to comply till 2024. And they have, you know, uh, back to then, depending on what your size is. But really, what that was was an announcement of potential rethinking by FDA mm -hmm. about some of the requirements they have around ag water, and to the extent that you're following this, you may be uh, able to um, share with the crowd greater details than I know. But um, they do. I did read the, the announcement of the date of uh, delayed compliance. And there really does seem to be an indication that they're going to have a lot of stakeholder engagement uh, in the coming year or two to try to figure out the best way forward. So from all of that, I conclude that there's still a lot of opportunity to influence this process from wherever you sit. So important stuff going on. Current events, flooding. No doubt you have seen these devastating photographs of historic flooding in the Midwest. And I have a lot of friends who are dealing with this. Um, it's, it's horrible. But it also harkens back to my memories of those photographs we saw in North Carolina when we had the hurricane come through and you saw the, um, the uh, manure lagoons with uh, large livestock operations being flooded in that water going in every which way. And so 
you know, we're seeing some of that now in the Midwest. It's not making the headlines because this is really at the point now where we're trying to save people and save livestock and in that really immediate um, <coughs> critical response to emergencies. But as time goes on, I expect we're going to hear more and more about water quality. The National Groundwater Association estimates that there are 13 million households that are dependent on well water. Um, now, that doesn't mean that public water supplies are not uh, at risk with this flooding. Certainly they are, but as many of you know, I'm sure when you're uh, a private well household, uh, the risk is seemingly always higher. And right now, estimates are that uh, groundwater, uh, the, the well water contamination is probably uh, significant, significant across 10 states, probably a million households. So a um, lot of ag pollutants there. Uh, as well with the flooding, we're also seeing a lot of um, hay and grain that's being lost. And, uh, and what, are, what are farmers to do with that lost uh, materials? Well, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, I think it is, have put out a joint bulletin advising farmers about using that wet grain, the adulterated grain and, and hay as uh, amendments on their fields. And they recognize that it's really hard to understand what the nutrient value is of that grain with any kind of certainty. And they are saying that you should disc it into the, uh, into the soil the day you apply it to protect uh, particularly birds from, the, you know, from any kind of poisoning. But um, there's a lot of stuff out there that needs to find uh, a new home, an unplanned home. So from, from all of this, it, it, it just really reminds me that we haven't built resilient systems for a world where climate is going to become uh, not a not a annual issue, but but just almost a monthly issue. It's just front and center, and this may be changing hearts and minds in farm country too about the way they think about environmental regulations. Time will tell. Water trading, so. You may have seen in December that EPA and USDA sent out a letter encouraging water trading market mechanisms to deal with, uh, with water quality. We have, uh, I know I was part of the Obama administration, but this may surprise you. I have friends in the Trump administration. It's a small world. Um, we have an undersecretary at USDA, Bill Northey, who's the Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation. He came from Iowa, where he was very, very involved in ag water issues. And so he brings that expertise, that level of knowledge, which I think is really good for, for both federal agencies. Um, in February, the, the USDA and EPA jointly issued a trading memo on principles that they like to see in trading mechanisms. And of course, this is not brand new. We've seen some of this under the Clean Water Act over the years. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's where the Trump administration has their comfort zone. And from, what I, you know, from this, I conclude that there's opportunity there to have really great discussions with policy leaders in town and try to get um, some additional market mechanisms in place, which of course is one of the priorities, as I understand, of the Sustainable, Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. Um, you know, what we've seen in wetlands mitigation, what we've seen in acid rain, some of these programs of the years are really quite remarkable. In DC, the city here in particular has had really great success in um, uh, solar, as a, uh, with solar recs. Um, the kind of uh, trading that goes on there. So I'm all excited about that. Let's wait and see. Dietary guidance. So um, I know diets were briefly touched upon in a number of ways already today. Uh, 64 countries um, produce dietary guidance for their citizens. 
We used to have the food guide pyramid. Now we have half of uh, the my plate, which the basic message is half a plate should be fruits and vegetables. Um, we put out U.S. dietary guidance every five years, and the season has begun. Let the party begin. The last uh, guidance was issued in 2015. It's a joint responsibility between USDA and FDA. And I was in charge largely of this effort in 2010 when I was a deputy. And then in 2015, I was one of the people on the outside of the process advocating that sustainability should be among the criteria for dietary guidance. Uh, that was really um, new at the time. The first couple countries that actually came out with sustainability as part of their dietary guidance were um, Brazil and the Netherlands. The Netherlands actually made very specific by gram, by age of person recommendations about the limit of meat in the diet, and they divided it by red meat and other. Um, so that was pretty remarkable, scared a lot of people here in the United States that a government would do something that crazy. And uh, since then, other countries have followed suit. I mean, it's not a big parade. I think we're talking Germany, uh, Sweden, uh, maybe one other country. So it's still a very small number. But um, we're in the season again, and it's another uh, place where you're going to see active discussions around what's the appropriate amount of animal protein in the diet and how should we be consuming that protein because not all proteins are equal. And people are going to be relating this pretty um, closely to climate needs and the need for reduced consumption. And it's very hard for us when you look, Bruce mentioned uh, this idea of eating less meat is out of kilter with where the trends are and that's absolutely true because it's not in the U.S. that people are eating more and more meat. It's, it's certainly not in the decline, as some people think. But it's really the, the um, improving economies and African and Asian nations that have these projections of meat consumption just uh, skyrocketing. And when you uh, calculate greenhouse gas emissions based on those upward projections, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's devastating to the planet. And it's really hard for those climate advocates in the United States or in Western countries to say to these other countries, you know, you shouldn't be eating so much meat when we haven't tightened our own belts. So this dietary guidance process, I think, is very important. Not everyone follows my plate, obviously, but um, it does back into a lot of federal nutrition programs. I told you that 77% of that farm bill largesse is for nutrition assistance programs. Some of them, like school meals, for example, have to be in compliance with dietary guidelines. So even if um, you and I choose not to follow that guidance from the government, um, there are ways where it actually can be very meaningful. And hopefully it overall influences people anyhow. Uh, the New Green Deal. Well, I don't have a lot to say on this. And the reason is, is because somehow the food and ag sector was not, was hardly a passing thought when they constructed the New Green Deal, which I find really surprising because a lot of the leaders there are really outspoken on environmental agendas and, you know, coming out of uh, Poland with the last uh, climate uh, negotiation, the last COP, I think people are starting to recognize more and more how much food and agriculture are really, uh, you know, the, the, the sector has really got to be top of the agenda and it has been overlooked, under-investigated, under-resourced in terms of the kind of change this is that we need to make. But somehow the New Green Deal framers miss that. Um, there's hope that there will be some big infrastructure package here um, in the short term. Well, you know, Washington's doing so well in um, developing bipartisan legislation. We'll see. But if it does happen, that New Green Deal plays into a couple years of work and articulation by the Trump administration about what needs to be in an infrastructure bill. Traditional ag interests are really focused on making sure that we have 
improved uh, infrastructure to allow barge traffic in particular, but they have a lot of big needs. We all have a lot of big needs. And the question is, are some of the interests of people in this room, how could it play out in an infrastructure bill? Because that seems to be among very few things that has a breath of life in it, that has the potential to cross the finish line at some point. Okay. I want to tell you a little bit about the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Uh, we're a new center. We started uh, just last year. Um, and we are all about a broad approach, a food systems framework approach to, to uh, a lot of the great problems of the day. And we're really excited to be at Arizona State where our university president doesn't call us faculty, he calls us solutionaries. Where he's, we're just writing papers and um, very proud of our publication CV. He is not going to be satisfied. He wants us to go out and solve the critical problems of the world. And that's why I went to ASU, because I think that's the right tone, and it's an exciting place to be. When we developed our early on agenda for the Sweetie Center, Michael Crow, if you've met this guy, he's a force of nature. He wanted like a strategic plan on my very first day on the job. He did. I sent him a letter. I suggested so I'm a little late. OK, so someone does know Michael Crow. Very good. So I did give him some ideas, and we've been pursuing those ideas this year that I think they're going to be core to what the Sweetie Center does. The, um, one of the issues that we're working on is true cost accounting. And I'm going to be in Brussels next week for an international meeting of people involved with true cost accounting. What this is is efforts to come up with a commonly used framework among scholars to put valuation on the externalities of food production, both positive and negative. The idea is not to say food should be more expensive. I mean, that's a hard thing to say, especially, well, not especially, everywhere. Here in the United States, we have you know, over 40 million people who struggle with food insecurity saying that I want food to be more expensive, that's not really, um, you know, it's, it's not really a, a, a great leading line, right? But what this group and others who are working in the true cost accounting space are really interested in is greater transparency about what the true costs of food are. So that policymakers, industry leaders, NGO leaders have better insights and can move their, their work in certain directions that uh, achieve the goals that they really have. So for the last three years, I've been on a steering committee that has been supported by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food and based within the United Nations Environment Program that's involved uh, nearly 150 scholars across 33 countries working on this. And it will continue. And you know, when you think about phosphorus, uh, uh, you know, it's positive and negative impacts in the food and ag space. You know, how do we account for that and, and make it more visible to people? Because that seems to be a very important step to getting kinds of resolutions that we all hope for. So true cost accounting, one of my things. Um, we're really interested in working with private industry, and I'm sure some of this comes out of my frustration about the intractability of policy initiatives in this town right now. But we are seeing movement, and a lot of movement in the food and ag space. One of the groups that I'm following uh, most recently is the Sustainable Food Policy Alliance. It's a group of four companies that broke off of the Grocery Manufacturers Association because they felt that um, they needed more progressive policies, in part because their consumer base, maybe more than part. Their consumer base is demanding different kinds of approaches. And the four companies in that group are Danone, Unilever, Nestle, and Mars. They just came out, by the way, with a statement about the dietary guidelines uh, last week calling for a more attention to climate and other environmental issues, water being among them. So what's going on in industry that we should be watching? And one of the areas that the Sweetie Center is tracking is what's going on in venture capital. And I'm involved with a, 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 
a bit role and a couple of venture capital firms in part because I'm getting uh, to see these decks of all these really interesting startups that have all kinds of great ideas. Now some of the VC money is coming from Silicon Valley where people made their money in tech and now they want to take their disruptive thinking and bring it to the food and ag sector. Welcome. Um, some of it's coming from other areas. You have traditional big ag businesses who are feeling that as big institutions, they've become somewhat inert. They don't have the nimbleness that they need to uh, have in this evolving world. And so you see even big giants like Tyson setting up venture capital arms. But I read something, and that's why I have to put the glasses on, in Ag Food Funder, Ag Funder, um, just recently that said that startups in 2018 raised $16.9 billion. So there's real money out there which um, gives hope for people in this room, people that you know, who have really great ideas. Um, there's new interest in um, a variety of places to try to get money to entrepreneurs to do new and great things organic. So one of the things the Sweetie Center wants to do is become an unbiased voice for organic research and policy. There's a lot of good reason for this, um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there in the countryside about what the organic standards are. But one thing, and related to our animal agriculture discussions already today, is that organic requires ruminants to be on pasture. And you're seeing some companies are even going the, the um, next step and requiring pasture beyond what's required in the rule. But there are a lot of things about organic that can be really very um, uh, rewarding in terms of conservation on ag land. And it also is a great stepping stone for young farmers. We know that the average age of farmers is about 60 years of age, we've got to bring on the next generation of people on our working lands. And one way to do it, since many of these new people are interested, didn't hail from the farm. They're not getting mom and dad's farmland in their, you know, 300K uh, combine. They're starting uh, with a college degree and a glint of optimism. <laughs> I'll kill that pretty quickly. Anyhow, it's a, it's a tough life. Um, and so one of the things that does allow them succeed is if they go into high value crops like fruits and vegetables and they do so organically so they get that little bit of premium. So it's not just environmental values that we're excited about with organic but also some of the structural aspects of American agriculture. So those were my nine things. Thank you very much.